Howdy, Psych92 here, and in this episode we are going to be working on our analog envelope generator and amplifier sections, and that will actually complete our electrical design for BitBase. So after that, we should have a fully working synthesizer that sounds pretty rad, especially for bass lines. Just like in the last episode, if we were to go with my standard format, you guys would have to sit through quite a bit of LT spice before we actually got to hear how it sounded. So instead what we're going to do is I'm just going to mess with the completed synth for a bit. You guys can hear how it sounds when it's completed, so let's go ahead and just make some bleep loops. Alright, so first off I want to kind of explain why there's been such a delay in getting this video out. As I'm sure only like two of you know, I'm in grad school right now and grad school can get pretty hectic. So that's pretty much what's been going on uh, this last month or so. And with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get back to BitBase. In the last episode we had our filter and power supply sections working and we were pretty much just waiting on our envelope generator and amplifier sections. So let's go back and redraw our block diagram just so that we can refresh ourselves on what we're trying to do. Alright, so first let's remind ourselves of our audio path. So we're going to start with our oscillator section and that's going to be outputting raw waveforms and that audio is going to go to our filter section which is going to remove some of the harmonics of those waveforms and then the audio coming out of the filter is going to go into the amp which is going to modulate the volume of the signal and then finally that's going to be our output and that's going to go to our headphones or our audio interface or wherever we want it to go. So what really makes the synth interesting is the envelope generator section. So what that does is it takes in a gate signal, which is going to be that LED that turns on and off. So when we press the key, it turns on. When, it, when we let it go, it goes off. And it's going to basically be modulating the cutoff of our filter and the gain of our amplifier. So say we hit the gate signal, so we, we hit a key and it goes on. Gate goes high. Uh, we have, we have the, we're, then we're in the attack stage. So the attack is going to slope up at some rate to a threshold. Then. After that, once it reaches that threshold, then it's going to decay at some rate down to our sustain level. And once we, while we hold that key down, it's basically just going to stay at that sustain level. And then once we let go of the key and the gate goes low, then we're basically going to decay at some rate to our minimum voltage. And that's the release stage of the envelope generator. So basically put in simpler terms, the envelope generator is going to give us the dynamicness to our sound, if that makes any sense. So this is the standard subtractive synthesizer paradigm. A lot of times you'll have a separate envelope generator for filter and a separate, separate one for amplifier, but this is the general uh, paradigm for it. Okay, so now that we're all refreshed and we know what we're trying to do, let's talk about the chip that's going to be at the heart of our envelope generator section, and also why the synth is called BitBase with three fives at the end and that chip is the NE555 timer. Typically this chip is used in an A-stable multi-vibrator configuration, and basically what that means is that it's used uh, as basically an oscillator for timing purposes. We're going to use it in a monostable configuration, however, and what that means is that each time the trigger is hit, it's going to act more in a one-shot manner. The circuit that we're going to be using is 
heavily based on a design by Renee Schmitz. And if we were to just jump right into that circuit, it would be super easy to get lost. So what we're gonna do instead is I'm gonna draw a block diagram of each of the sort of sections of it. And we're gonna go through the function of each section of it. And then I'm going to explain as we go along. And I want you to just keep that in mind while we build the actual circuit. And it'll make a lot more sense, hopefully. Well, I just realized I had my light turned off that whole time. So the lighting is probably gonna be pretty dog shit in the beginning of this video, but that's okay. Um, I got the block diagram drawn. I know there's a glare there, but I'm gonna explain what most of that says when the time comes. So just uh, bear with me here. I'm, uh, I'm a little tired today. All right, so even this block diagram is kind of overwhelming at first, but like I said, I'll get into it. So first thing to remember is that when you press a key, the gate goes high, and when you let go, the gate goes low. So what we're gonna have here is first, this gate signal that's coming out of our Arduino is going to go into our transistor section here, and, there, and I'll explain the functions of the, of the other transistors in a second, but out of the last one comes a low pulse, just a single low pulse. And that's gonna to go to the trigger, and that's what the trigger is expecting, that single low pulse, because once that happens, the output will go high. All right, so notice that after the out right here, which is the output, I've drawn this symbol here, which I'm using to denote a diode, which allows current to flow in that direction. So current can only flow in this direction out of the output. So then that's gonna go through an attack potentiometer, and depending on the resistance, it's going to charge this electrolytic capacitor here at a certain rate. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, edit this part out. So let's assume that the resistance of the attack pot is fairly high. Well, if that was the case, then this capacitor would be charging like this. So that's the attack section, our stage of our envelope generator. Also, it's important to notice that we have a buffer right here. And basically, this is gonna be connected to the same net as that capacitor. And the reason for that is that if we had the rest of our circuitry uh, without the buffer just connected directly to that it would affect our resistances and the charging and discharging of the capacitor so we want to isolate this circuit here okay so once we have our ramp up here we're going to reach a certain voltage that is the threshold of the 555 so that's also why this threshold pin here is connected to that same net so once that threshold is reached the output is going to no longer be um, outputting voltage and charging this capacitor. So that's going to allow current to flow from the capacitor to the decay pot, and then it's gonna go through the decay pot, and then it's gonna sink current into this op amp that we have here, and that's gonna be at some rate depending on the resistance of the decay pot. And we have this sustain pot here, which is going to be the level that it's going to fall to, and this is basically just set up like a voltage divider. We have a positive, uh, the positive terminal going to five volts, and then we have the negative one going to discharge, and then the middle pin going to this op amp here. And if you remember the golden rules of op amps, those two pins, if it's in a negative feedback configuration, those two pins wanna be at the same voltage. So this is gonna sync current until it's at that specific voltage. So what that's gonna look like is going to be we're gonna have you know we're gonna have reached our threshold we're gonna start decaying and then once we reach our sustain level we're gonna be sustaining now you might be thinking well if current could flow this way through the decay pot why couldn't it flow this way through the release pot and the reason for that is that while the gate is is still high so we're still pressing a key this is the, the, this transistor here, this voltage here is going to be five volts, which is gonna be of course higher than this. So it's not gonna to wanna to sink to higher voltage. So it's going to have to go through the decay pot. However, when we release the key and the gate goes low, this transistor is going to be biased, which means that it can start sinking current. So any current that's left here, which is gonna be at our sustain level, is now going to flow through here and then sink through that transistor down to our minimum voltage. 
and it's also connected to our reset pin here which once it reaches that minimum voltage we can start this whole process over again now i am well aware that that is a lot of information to just absorb at once so if you need to pause the video and look at that again and try to understand it again that would probably be helpful but we are going to go into lt spice right now and we're going to make the actual circuit so if you just know at least a little bit of this hopefully that will help you when we're building the actual circuit All right, so right here we have our gate in, which we're simulating here with a pulse with one cycle. So see, let's see what happens when we simulate it. So here's our gate, and let's check each section of our transistors. So first, this one here, and we can see that when the gate goes high, the transistor goes low. Then we have this one here, which when this transistor goes low, the voltage here goes high because now it's no longer biased. And then finally, we have this one here, which only does this short little low pulse. And the reason that is, is because we have this capacitor right here, which only allows a very short bias here. Another thing that's important to note is that this second transistor here is going to be how we're going to sync current uh, at our release stage. So notice that right when the gate goes low, which is right here, this transistor becomes biased and current can flow through the transistor to ground. Now you might be wondering what these diodes that I just added here are for. And basically they're for protecting against negative voltage at the base inputs. So let's remove this one here and see what happens. Okay so first this is with it and now when we remove it all of a sudden this goes almost negative 4.5 volts. So let's add another cycle of our pulse, which will simulate another key press and see what happens when this is, when the configuration is like this. So now we can see we get our original low pulse on the first key press, but not on the second one. Now if we put this diode back, and run it, we get both low pulses. The reason for this has to do with the capacitor sourcing and syncing going on right here. So with the diode, we can see we have uh, both sourcing and syncing going on. And if we remove it, all of a sudden we're only syncing, and it's only really at the very first one there. All right, so now we'll add our 555, our op amp buffer, and our attack and release sections. We're going to be using the LM358, which is a general, uh, dual general purpose op amp, which is perfect since we need two op amps for this circuit. And I'll explain the buffer first since it's the simplest to explain. Basically, it's just an op amp in a negative feedback configuration with some amplification when using these resistors here. So we're scaling it a bit. So now let's look at the trigger input to the 555. And we can see when we simulate it here that when the trigger goes low, the output goes high, just like we expect. So our actual output of this looks like this. And, and right now we have very low resistances for attack and release, and that's why we're getting such sharp edges here. If we were to increase our resistance, like say to 100K, it would look like that. So we have quite a slow attack there. But let's bring it back to 1K. So what's happening here is our output's going high. It's coming through here. It's only going in this direction and charging this capacitor here. And then once we reach this threshold here, we actually don't have anywhere to go. So the current remains. And then once we are the voltage remains at this capacitor here, and then once we let go of our key, so the gate goes low, then if we check right here, this also goes low and current is allowed to sync through the release potentiometer down through this transistor. So really the idea of using different resistances to change the rate of the charge of the capacitor is really the same phenomenon that we saw in our filter circuit in, it's just at a much slower rate in this case. So you can see now I've added our 
decay and sustain sections, and basically what's going on here is just like in the block diagram. So, when we run this, we can see that our output charges to a certain, uh, certain voltage, and then as soon as that threshold is hit here, our output stops charging and it starts to decay. And basically, the threshold stops giving a high output voltage and also current is allowed to flow through the discharge pin here so we set a certain sustain level using this voltage divider here which is set at 2 volts we don't quite get 2 volts but that's close enough and then current is allowed to sink through here so that these two inputs match if you see here they actually do match and then finally, our buffer here allows us to scale our input because, remember, this, this whole circuit here is in 5 volts, but this here is positive 9 to negative 9, which is our analog voltages. So that basically just scales it up a bit so that we can use it with our, our other analog circuitry. And this will basically be the final output here. But of course, these are potentiometers and we can change these values to get a greater or less decay, sustain, etc. Alright, so for the most part, our envelope generator section is done, but there is actually still a tiny bit of a problem. And basically, we're peaking at 7.7 .7 volts, which is fine, but our minimum voltage is 0.3 volts, and that's an issue because our filter and amplifier sections will still be outputting audio if we have the amp bias inputs at 0.3 volts. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to scale that voltage down to that minimum voltage down to negative 8 volts at least so that we can produce silence. So now the question is how can we do that? And the answer is simple. We can use an op amp in a sort of strange configuration and that's going to allow us to scale that voltage. So let's jump back into LT Spice and design a scaler for our envelope generator. So this is the finished scaler and the first thing that you should notice about it is that R2 is connected to 9 volts instead of ground. And the reason for this is that we're actually using the resistors as a voltage divider in order for us to be able to swing down to our negative rail. Our envelope generator is outputting 0.3 volts at the lowest and around 7.7 .7 volts at the highest. So let's see how it re reacts to these voltages with uh, this scaler. So here's our minimum voltage. If we run the simulation, now we're getting around negative 8.81 volts. Let's bring it up to our maximum positive voltage. Now it's up to about 5.1 volts, which is still fine. Another thing to keep in mind here is that in this simulation, I'm using a UA741. But in the real circuit, I'm actually using an OP27, which is actually totally overkill for this application, but I didn't have a rail-to-rail -rail op amp lying around, and, and the OP27 was close enough. And the reason that we need a rail-to-rail -rail op amp, or at least close to one, is because we need to re reach less than negative 8 volts to achieve silence out of the amplifier and filter sections. And a lot of op amps have difficulty reaching their negative rails, and the UA741 is definitely one of them. So I tried this circuit originally with the UA741 and it didn't get that low. There was still audio coming out. So that's why I had to replace it with the OP27. So this is another example of how simulations don't really work out perfectly. So, you know, I'm saying that this is the voltage here, but it might not be. So really what we have to do is after simulating these and getting a rough estimate, we have to build the circuits and then test them out, see if we have the right ranges that we want for our sound. And that's exactly what I did, and I, like I said, I ended up replacing the UA741 with the OP27. We've built our envelope generator section, and now we've built our scaler. So after that, we should have a nice control voltage to be sending to our filter and amplifier sections. Now, the thing is, is that we've simulated these. and that simulation can only get so accurate. So really, all the values, even the values from our original filter, are tentative. And we might, have, we might have to change those values to get better ranges. So we'll eventually build the circuit on the breadboard, listen to it, see how it sounds, and then change things accordingly. For now, we need to build our amplifier section first. 
So we're gonna be using the same process that we did with our filter section, meaning that we are going to look at the data sheet, see if there's an application that fits our needs, and then we're going to modify it a bit to make it fit our needs even more. So let's go into the LM13700 data sheet since we're gonna use that exact same OTA for our amplifier section as well. We already went over this IC in the last episode, so if you haven't checked that out already, you probably should do that since we're just gonna skip right away over to the application section. And you can see here that the very first application for this is a voltage controlled amplifier. Now, of course, we're gonna have to modify it a bit as their design requirements don't quite fit in line with ours, but this is a really good starting point. So let's build this circuit in LT Spice and then we'll modify it to our requirements. Now from our filter section, we're going to be expecting a max voltage of two volts and a minimum voltage of negative two volts. And those are pretty rough values, but they'll give us enough to work with for our design. For our simulation, we'll use this square wave here as our input to our amplifier, and let's run the simulation and see what our output is looking like so far. So here's our input, it's just a, a square wave from 2 volts to negative 2 volts, and our output here is pretty much a line level signal. Now that's already looking pretty great, but before we start modifying things, let's talk more about what's going on with this circuit. So first we'll talk about the inverting and non-inverting inputs. <clears throat> As we talked about in the last video, these are differential inputs, meaning the amplifier amplifies the difference between the voltages. I want you to think of R2 and R3 as a potentiometer with the middle pin to ground, and that's exactly what we'll use as well, a 1K ohm potentiometer. So we have our audio source current flowing through R4, which is just a current limiting resistor, then it'll flow through R3, and some of it will flow to ground, and some of it will flow through R2. Now, if we probe both inputs, we can see that there's a difference between the two voltages that can be amplified, especially considering the inverting input is actually inverted. So let's go ahead and do that. So again, there's, there's a difference there. Now, if we put R3 to 10 ohms and R2 to 990 ohms, we can see that there's almost no AC difference between the two inputs. So let's try that. Now, there might be a DC difference here, but the AC difference is very minimal. And so it might be outputting some DC voltage, but it really doesn't matter because we have this coupling capacitor here anyway. So in this configuration, basically what we're doing here is we have the wiper turned almost all the way to one side and that's going to be our minimum voltage. I'll explain a couple minor things now as well. R1 is our diode bias, which basically gives us a linear response to increasing amplitude, which is great for precision engineering applications, but audio with nonlinear properties pretty much translates to that analog sound, so we're going to just remove that diode in a second. And really the only reason that we didn't do that with the filter was because there was really no audible difference to my ears anyway, so I just left it in. R7 is our trans transistor emitter resistor, so we can get a voltage output because we need that resistor in there, otherwise it's only a current. C1 is, like I said, our coupling capacitor, which is used since this is our final output and we only want to pass AC audio signal, so this capacitor only passes AC and it blocks DC. And R5 is used just like it was in our last circuit. So it's a current limiting resistor and it goes to our amp bias input, which controls the gain of our amplifier. So with the current flowing through R5, we'll control the gain of the circuit. And if we change the voltage input here at V4, we can see that it changes, with, changes our uh, output amplitude. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's just change it to, I don't know, one right now. Oh, let's change these back as well. So here we have roughly 1.4 volts. If we bring this back up to nine, that voltage is increased a bit. We have more gain. And the last thing here is R6, which basically is used to reduce the amount of current at the base of the Darling compare. So some of the current at this output here is going to flow through 
R6 to ground. And with this simple setup, we already have pretty close to a line level output. So now we're gonna make the few modifications to make this sound a tiny bit better in my opinion. The first thing that we're gonna do is remove that diode bias resistor. And when we do that though, we're gonna have an issue when we simulate it, and we'll see that right here. Now we can see that our output voltages are way too high, past our rails even. So the simplest way to fix this would be by limiting the current flowing into the amp bias input. And we can do that by changing R5 to a higher resistance. So let's change it to 220K and run it again. Excellent, now we basically have our initial voltage output and that's pretty much it for the amplifier design. It should sound pretty good and have some nonlinear properties and possibly even saturate when our filter goes into self oscillation. So let's build our finished circuit and see how it sounds. So here I have the finished circuit all laid out on my desk here. As you can see, it's a lot of components and it took three breadboards to complete. Also another thing to note is that I took out the gate LED since we're actually using that as an input to the envelope generator now. And, but it's all working, it's all, it all should sound pretty good. So let's go ahead and test it and test some of the parameters of our new sections. Now let's increase our attack. So that's working as intended. Let's bring it back. Now our release. Right now it's at a decent rate. Let's cut it off entirely. So that's with no release. Now we can change our sustain. Let's give it no sustain. So now all we have is our decay. Let's make that longer. So that's working as intended too. Last thing to check is our volume. That's working too. So everything's working great. Now let's just have some fun with it. All right, so in my opinion, it sounds pretty damn good, actually. Um, it's definitely way better suited for bass lines than the high range stuff because, again, there is, we're using an Arduino Uno, there is a bit of distortion at the high end, but I could imagine getting creative with that as well. I also noticed that I didn't um, crank the resonance really on any of that. Um, I probably should have done that because it makes for some really nice squelchy bass lines, very acid-like. And I could definitely see myself using that a lot. I mean, just as a, a, an acid groove box, it, it, would, it would be pretty cool. So hopefully maybe I, I did some of that in the very first example at the beginning of the video. Hopefully there's an example of the acid bass sound. I, I never cranked it into self-oscillation though, and I should do that. Maybe in the next video, I'll, I'll mess around with it some more so you guys can hear it some more. Uh, or you could build it yourself. That would be cool too. But, I, could, I, I really like the way it sounds and I can imagine myself using it in my own music. And actually, you may not have noticed it, but the song that you're listening to right now was actually written entirely with BitBase. 
aside from the drums, of course. So since I do like the way that it sounds now, I'm actually not going to modify any of the components. I think I think the the ranges are are pretty are pretty good for what it is, and I also don't have that much time, so I'm just not going to do it. But uh, if you want to maybe do a spin on it and, and change some of the resistor values and, and get it more to to your range that you want, go feel, feel free to do that. And anyways, all the simulation files, schematics, breadboard layouts, code, everything else can be found on my GitHub page. And if you guys have any questions about those files, just let me know and I will answer you properly. Now there's probably something else that you might have noticed as well. And that's that I left one half of the LM13700 unused. Now what I'm doing on my board is I'm terminating it by setting the amp bias to ground. So that'll just not output any audio. But what um, you could do is you could run through that LM13700 data sheet, find an application that only uses one OTA and implement that. And you could you know, maybe do a sample and hold or something else and make make BitBase your own. So to recap, in this episode, we designed our analog envelope generator section and our analog amplifier section by using circuit simulation in LT Spice. And then after that, we built the circuit and we verified that it was to our liking. The next step is going to be taking this crazy insane breadboard layout and turning that into a nice clean printed circuit board. And I've talked about a couple ways, a couple possible ways that I wanted to do this, but I think that I finally found a nice trade-off that's going to keep everybody happy. In the next episode, I'm going to briefly show you how to use fritzing to lay out our PCB. Then I'm going to show you how to generate the files necessary for getting your boards manufactured by services like Oshpark if you want to send out and you know receive boards in the mail. And then finally, I'm going to show you how I manufacture PCBs myself using double-sided copper clad, a few tools, and a few noxious chemicals. Oh, and also there's a kind of annoying bug in the code, so in the next episode I'll briefly show you how I fix that. But after that, really all that we need to do is fabricate an enclosure for our synthesizer. So in the episode after the next episode, that's what we'll be doing. I'll be basically going over a bunch of different methods and different ways that you can create your own enclosures for your DIY synth projects. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Hopefully it won't be as long of a wait as this one was. Laters.